You said it already. Everybody, Rachel, she's going to be giving us some updates. She's our missionary to Honduras, and she is back and forth um, every couple of months. And so we're really excited that she, she wants to give you an update, but also a word from the Lord. So are you ready? Yeah. Buckle up, because it's going to be fun. <laughs> Jesus, I bless my sister right now. That as she speaks, it would be your words and your heartbeat, Lord. We would hear with ears wide open. In Jesus' name, anoint her now. Amen. Good morning. Buenos dias. <laughs> I told Leslie and Travis, now I feel more comfortable speaking in Spanish than I do English in front of people. So I don't know. We'll see what comes out. Um, I'm so glad to be back. I know a lot of you have checked in with me, and I am here all summer. Um, I definitely miss the church and getting to worship with you guys on a Sunday and get to sit um, under the pastorship and leadership of Leslie and Travis. So it's so great to be back with you. Um, I guess for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rachel and I am born and raised in Dover. And I was 13 when I went on my first mission trip to Honduras. Um, it radically changed my life. I was going just on week-long trips with my dad and Todd Cox and his daughter, Nicole, which, Troy, if you'd like to show that first picture, you can. Um, it was just like the typical church mission trips, but then we started to break away and form our own daddy-daughter teams where we were just going up into the mountains. We had baby blankets, shoes, and clothes that we would get to give people. Um, and that's where we really began to see the great needs for better health care, education, and community development. Um, so by the time I was 16, I was like, okay, God, I know that this is what you're calling me to. And so I really just wanted to jump right into it. But there was a process that he took me on, like most of you know, and I went to school to become a physical therapy assistant where I worked at a nursing home for five years. And many of you know that as much as I love therapy, I did not enjoy where I was working. It was, it's just healthcare is very challenging. And I began doing jobs that weren't necessarily under my job description, such as getting people up and dressed in the morning, brushing their teeth, taking them into the shower, which I, I did, but I was like, I got to a point where, you know, just this desire of being Honduras was so strong, and I had just been praying for a year that God would combine my love for therapy and my love for missions in Honduras and into an opportunity or a career, and I wasn't seeing it happen, so I became just a little bit frustrated of like, okay, God, what are you doing with these dreams and desires? And there was one day in particular that I felt like I was just stuck in the bathroom with everyone. And I was like, I'm so tired of being in these little bathrooms. And the Lord told me, Rachel, if I humbled myself enough to come to this earth, live among you, and wash my disciples' feet, the most that you could do is humble yourself and wipe someone's butt. And I'm like, well, that's kind of debatable. But I was like, okay. I will do it. I will take care of these people. And, you know, if they didn't have me, who else would they have? And I began to learn that it was all in my attitude. The Lord was like, if I can't trust you with this little bit, how much more am I going to be able to give you? Are you going to be responsible with? So I really made it my goal to love and serve them to the greatest and the best of my ability, not only because I love people and they deserve the best treatment possible, but also because I wanted to show the Lord that I could be responsible and um, faithful to the people and the tasks that he put before me, no matter how big or how small. So after a year, many of you know that that's whenever I got connected with Central American Medical Outreach, or CAMO, which I'll explain a little bit in more detail in a moment. So I began going on these week-long trips. And um, Troy, you can show the next picture, which is where I began to use my experience, my five years experience in the nursing home in Honduras. I was teaching at um, nursing homes. This is actually a nursing home run by a group of nuns. And it was super fun this last year. I was really able to dive into conversations about Catholicism and Christianity and kind of the differences and be able to pour into those patients and learn more about them. But then um, also just in the hospitals and in the clinics. And I realized that those 
five years were like building blocks and one experience after another was preparing me to be able to go into these areas to serve. So I would do a week and I, it was like my high point and then I would have to come back to taking people into the bathroom and walking up and down a hall and still doing therapy with people. And so even on the hard and frustrating days, I could have quit my job and I could have bought a plane ticket and I could have gone, but if I was not faithful to the task the Lord put in front of me now, how would I be faithful in the future things that I thought I wanted? So after several years of being faithful in that was whenever he promoted me to um, creating a branch of camo. Whenever I had talked to the founder, she was like, how about you become like a branch of our organization and go serve the small community of Subirana up in the mountains. So most of you know that in October, I quit my job as a therapist and moved down to Honduras where I was fully immersed in the culture, the language, trying to learn all things business and organization in another country. Um, I learned how to drive my truck and I think a lot of you saw the next picture on Facebook. I'll give like, you know, on Facebook, you can't go into all details, but on this trip, I told the guys, I said, you load that truck up as much as you want because it just handles better when there's more stuff in it. I don't know. And so they failed to tell me where we were going, which I've also learned now that I am so thankful that I don't know what's coming. I know a lot of us are like, God, just tell me what I'm, like, tell me what's next. No, I have come that I am so thankful he doesn't tell me what's coming next because I followed two other trucks and I can't even describe to you the steepness of these mountains that I was driving on. And like, I can't, there's no place in Ohio that I can even compare it to. And um, I was following and I went to turn, there was a fork in the road, I went to turn right and follow my coworkers and a school bus cut me off as it was coming down the hill along with another truck. So I had to stop on an incline, I never had practice with this type of driving. And I kept stalling the truck and stalling the truck and the bus driver got out and started putting rocks underneath my tires to help, I couldn't get it. And so my coworker came down and I humbly got out of the truck and the whole bus was probably like, oh, that makes sense. And so <laughs> I got into the back and got it up to where it needed to go. But you know, that's where, if I had known what the Lord was going to get me into, I probably would have chosen to go back to the nursing home, back to the old season where it was comfortable and familiar. And I think there's a time and a season to do what's directly in front of you, but then there's also a time and a season to jump out of your comfort zone and go and do what God has called you to do. And then you just got to roll with the punches when he throws these kinds of things at you. So, um... I guess, yeah, in, this, in these past nine months, I've learned to give myself a lot of grace because I was very, very hard on myself. Um, why I felt like I kept messing up, I wasn't able to fully communicate with the people, and the Lord just kept saying, Rachel, you're learning. Let me extend grace to you. Then he also kept telling me that I could do hard things. And I think that's the same for all of us, that sometimes he gives us these really big dreams and visions and sometimes we don't know how to go after it and he's like you don't have to achieve it all in one time it's just building block after building block and to encourage you that to just to take that leap of faith and even if it's hard he's going to give us the grace and the strength to get through it so um i guess also what i i realized during those times of waiting was just not to despise that season that you're in and to ask the Lord, what can I be doing now to prepare me for the future? So I was learning a lot in my job, but I also knew I had that desire in my heart to serve in Honduras, which meant I needed to learn the language. So after working all day, I would go home and I would study online. And then I was also a part of a really great small group of girls where we would just dig into the presence of the Lord and learned how to differentiate the voice of the world versus the voice of the Lord. And as I was just faithfully, consistently in the presence of God, um, and also preparing myself to live in another country. My encouragement is to you is what asking the Lord, what can I learn from this season? And who are the people that you've put in my path that I can faithfully serve here and now? So 
Before I share a little bit of an update on what the Lord has done in these last three to four months, I wanted to go into a little depth of who CAMO is. Um, so it's a nonprofit humanitarian organization. We're providing over 100,000 um, services to impoverished people directly. We have no idea the number of people we're impacting indirectly through our 27 programs. Um, these are some of them that are, are listed, um, that are just in function. They are Honduran, run, and led. Um, and then we bring down teams of medical professionals once or twice a year that provide education and training to the Honduran healthcare professionals. Um, our emphasis is never to take a job away from a Honduran, so we really want to train, equip, and empower the Hondurans to be able to serve their own communities. Um, this really hit hard, especially for me this week, because um, I learned a little bit of Kathy, the founder of Camo, her story, and I had never heard the story from her before. This week she shared that um, in her Peace Corps days back in the 1980s, she said she would walk to the hospital every day, and there was a group of shoe shiners, and the Don Chepe was the shoe shiner, and he said, Kathy, I want to shine your nursing shoes. And she's like, oh, but you only have black and brown shoe polish. And he's like, no, I bought white just for you. So every week she would go and get her shoes shined by Don Chepe. So after a year of building up a relationship with him, she was like, it's about to be Christmas. I have an extra sweatshirt. I want to give Don Chepe my sweatshirt. So she gifted it to him. He was so thankful because all he had was just a T-shirt. And it gets cold up in the mountains. And so she gave it to him. He was so thankful. The next week, she went back, and he wasn't there. The next week, she went back, and she finally was like, where's Don Chepe? He's there every single day. And they said, oh, Kathy, you didn't know. She's like, no. She said, Don Chepe went, and he sold that sweatshirt, and he went and bought as much alcohol as he could, and he drank himself to death. And so here, Kathy thought that what she was doing was a, a good gesture to help, and it actually um, really hindered and obviously was not what she was expecting. And it really put an impact on her heart of, yes, there are immediate needs, but are the immediate needs that we think are the needs actually what's going to make a difference in these people's lives? Or is it pouring into them on a more like training, educating type level and really walking alongside of them on a day-to-day -day basis going to be what makes the generational change that, that we've been going after? And the same thing happened to me in, in February and March. I was talking to my best friend Raquel, and I was reflecting back on the daddy-daughter trips that I used to do because we used to give food packages. And in our mind, we were meeting the immediate need of these people. They were hungry, and so we wanted to give them food. So that's what we did. And now Raquel and I have a much better relationship. And she said, Rachel, I didn't want to stop you because I knew you were doing it out of the goodness and the generosity of your heart. But she said, what you didn't realize was that when you gave the food packages to the coffee workers, they stopped working for the week. They didn't show up to work. So she said their mindset is when they have what they need, why would they try to advance? Like how we would think, you know, like, okay, great, I've got food. Now I can work a little bit harder to make more money. So what we ended up doing was stopping the economy of a whole town based on our own generosity. And it was like, wow, it just really got me thinking of what is the best thing that we can do to make the greatest impact um, in this country. So I really began to learn just the cultural way that and mindset that people began to think. And so um, on this last trip, I was there from February until early May, and some really um, big monumental things happened that um, I'm really excited to share with you. Um, the first thing was in February, my first week and a half, I went down with about 30 to 40 um, healthcare professionals. And every morning, somebody leads a devotion. And so they asked if I would do the first morning devotional. I said, absolutely. And this is in front of believers, non-believers, and Kathy, the founder. And so the night before, I'm like, okay, Lord, what do you want me to share? Because I had something prepared, but I knew it wasn't what I was supposed to do. And he was just like, there's power in the word of your testimony. And so I was like, okay. 
So I got up in front of the 30 to 40 people in the morning, and I just began to share what God did in my life and how I got to where I am today with missions in Honduras. And I had people, I think believers and non-believers, come up to me and be like, thank you so much for sharing. That really impacted my life and is going to impact me throughout the week. And I was like, I was just doing what the Lord told me to do. And um, about two days later, I'm getting coffee in Camo's office. And Kathy comes up to me and she said, Rachel, I need you to come to my office. And I'm like, oh, great, what did I do? Because <laughs> she can be kind of scary. And um, she sat down and she said, the Camo staff in Honduras has been talking about you. And I was like, okay. And she said, do you know what you have that no one else in the history of Camo has? volunteer-wise. I was like, no. She said, you have passion. She said, we haven't been able to find that in anyone else. And she said, and you have a wonderful support team back in the Dover, Philly area. You're able to raise support like we, we've never seen before. And she was like, we want to have you on staff as the assistant director of Camo USA. And I was like, right now? <laughs> and I was like, I was not preparing for this. And I said, well, what's going to happen in Euro? Because I said, I'm not going to abandon these people and these projects. And she said, no, you would be the assistant director of Camo USA and project manager of the Euro project. And I was like, well, I need a couple months to think about this because it was going to be a huge change for me. And so um, I, I began praying about it. And if I'm honest with you in those three months, which I'll share in a minute what else I was doing during that time. But um, I realized that I don't want to live on the mountain permanently. <laughs> um, there it, was, it was challenging when you're a young single female who doesn't have four children who are all teenagers at this point in my life, and they're not used to women going out and working. It was very hard to make friends, and just the culture was very different up in the mountains, but I still had a deep love for this community, but I was realizing the Lord was showing me, yes, you can still impact this community, you just don't have to feel stuck in one one spot, because like two, three or four days later after having this conversation with Kathy, Jose, the director of Camo, gets me on a hike, so he and I are alone, and he was like, Rachel, do you know what you have that no one else has? And I was like, passion. He's like, yes, passion. And he was like, all of the coworker, your coworkers at Camo truly believe that you are the next Kathy, that someday when Kathy is not here, you're going to be able to take over Camo. And he said, you can stay in Euro. He, he's like, you can live on that mountain. He's like, you can impact the region of Euro. Or he's like, you can join Camo and you can impact the entire country. And I was like, wow, I can't turn that up. <laughs> so um, I officially gave my yes back in May. So I'm an, uh, the assistant director of Camo USA. And yeah. yeah. So I, that was week one of being in Honduras, and so I still had pretty much three months to go. So I had invited my committee from Subirana to come to Camo because it's so hard to describe truly like what it is until you're there. And so um, we had them come, I think it's on the next slide. Oh, yes, so we had, this is Elvia, Raquel, and Juancito. Um, Juancito's the doctor who put my dad's shoulder back into place. Um, Raquel is a coffee farmer and Elvia is the government official and their minds were absolutely blown at the magnitude. They had, they were speechless and they absolutely love and respect Kathy and Jose. And that's where we really began to see um, just the possibilities and the potential of, of helping the Euro region. And so I got to work of of creating the committee and um, I had a bunch of supplies that I had brought up so I had gone to hospitals and clinics and began donating supplies to them which they were like kids at Christmas getting scissors. They were like we haven't had scissors to use to cut bandages and bandage material and suture material, things that are so easy for us to access that they just didn't have. And so um, I began just, just giving that all to them and, and continuing to just live among them, and it was during that time 
that the Lord reminded me of Matthew 25 of, of how to, it's mostly talking about stewarding money, but I believe that it's also how we manage our time, talents, and treasures. And the Lord said, you have done well and proven yourself to be my loyal and trustworthy servant. Because you have been faithful to steward and manage a small sum, now I will put you in charge of much, much more. You will experience the delight of your master who will say to you, come and celebrate with me. So as I was just doing daily life, I began to realize that it was through my faithfulness and obedience in the nursing home that that's what gave me the wisdom and the strength to be able to do what I did in these last couple months. So many of you know about Alexis, the boy with hydrocephalus that I had met, and um, I started taking him to his doctor's appointments. I thought he had a blood clot, so I rushed him to a different hospital. Well, here he had fractured his femur, and um, it was pretty much a month of me driving him around from hospital to hospital, in and out of doctor's appointments, um, doing this pretty much on my own, so I really had to learn fast about how broken the healthcare system is and how they were like, well, the, the boy needs surgery, but you have to go buy the pins and screws. And I'm like, well, where do you buy the pins and screws? And then they're like, well, then we'll talk about it, but by the way, the surgeon is on vacation for the next six weeks, so he'll just be laying in this bed for six weeks. And I'm like, that's, that's not okay. And you know, I learned how to fight for my patients in the nursing home because before I was like, oh, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. And now I'm like, no, I'm here to advocate for the patient. So I had no problem marching up to these doctors and nurses in Honduras and fighting for the patient. And um, so it was just simply driving this child around and taking him to his doctor's appointments. There was another girl named Valerie um, who is nine years old. And I think she's on the next slide. Yeah, this is Valerie. She was born in the U.S. and then her family moved back to Honduras about two or three years ago. So she speaks really great English um, and she really missed the U.S. culture. And so I would go to her house and we would read English books together and go hiking together and just speak in English. And um, then the last person um, I had heard of, um, this man who was abandoned by his family and um, just didn't have a whole lot of food. And I was like, I want to go visit him because, like, old people just have such a sweet spot in my heart. And um, he was so ashamed and embarrassed because all he was cooking was bananas for lunch. And he didn't have any chairs for us to sit on, so we didn't go into his home. And the next day, there was actually another missionary, Clayton, who does a chick ministry. So he purchases chicks, and then we give he gives out like 10 chicks so that they can raise them up and then they can have a constant meal source. And so we went back to him the next day and had given him chicks and had prayed over him. And I just asked if I could pray and the man just instantly hit his knees. It was just like such a powerful moment. But looking back last week, there was a friend who was like, Rachel, like, how did you see the Lord move? And like, what was like your biggest God moments? And beyond what happened with Kathy and with Camo, I was like, gosh, I don't know, I was just doing daily life. And I, I realized that what I did was so simple and something that we could all do so easily here, but it just kind of looks cooler because I'm doing it in another country. But like literally all I did, I drove a child to a doctor's appointment and I visited a man who didn't have family who could have easily been in a nursing home and I read a book to a little girl. Like, that, if, we're, if we strip away the fact that it was in another country in another language, that's what it was. And so, and if I'm being completely honest too, there were days that I was frustrated and I'm like, I'm supposed to be doing bigger things like this. People at home are probably like, what is she doing? Isn't she doing anything big? Where's the big clinic? And where are all these programs that she talks about chemo doing? And the Lord is like, will you be faithful again? with the people that I've put in front of you, a nine-year-old girl, a seven-year-old boy, and an 80-something-year-old man. And so I was just like, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do, so this is who I'm gonna serve. And so I just want to encourage you all to, to not look down on the season of life and the people that you are called to serve. Like Travis has, had said, like, who are you called to serve? Who is directly in front of you? And and so that is my encouragement to you guys today is to look for those opportunities of just those small things that may not seem that big 
on this side of heaven, but I think are truly what, you know, it's the upside down kingdom culture. Like that, I think in heaven, those small acts of obedience are actually like the biggest celebrations in heaven. So um, that's kind of a summary. I'm excited to share kind of the next steps. Once I got home and began like processing everything and started working in Orville four to five days a week, um, Kathy was like, okay, Rachel, like, now's the time. She's like, you're, you've got to start. She, I'm more of like, oh, let's like, wait, let's make sure everything's in order. And she's like, no, it's time to go. And I was like, okay. So I'm excited to share kind of what the 2023-2024 plans are for the Euro Project. So we are going to start launching a literacy program. We're going to start in grades one and two. So all students in first and second grade, there's about 70 kids in each grade are going to get textbooks in math, science, social studies, and Spanish, and um, then also going to provide a 300-book library that can be accessed by all the students in the elementary school. We believe that by pouring into the teachers and the students, they're our future, and so they deserve the best education as possible. Um, and then we'll also, in September, bring all of the teachers down to CAMO, where they'll get three or four days of intense um, training to really know how to do, because they've never had these books before. We're talking, like, the best of the best textbooks. So we want to really train them on how to run this program out with success. And then we also want to remodel the public health clinic. Our goal, the government has said that they're going to provide $6,000 to renovate the building. Unfortunately, all of the taxpayer money that the people in Subirana give never come back up to Subirana. So our goal is to hold the government accountable and tell them, you promised the community $6,000, CAMO will match it with $6,000, so that'll be $12,000 that we'll be able to pour in, remodel it, and then put in a dental and an ultrasound program next year, which CAMO has the equipment that they will give to us, and then we will train the doctor in how to use it. So, yeah. So ultimately, with this position, I'm still um, responsible for raising 100% of the funds for my salary and for all of the projects and programs with what you see here and then in the future. So I know a lot of you have asked ways that you can be supporting this ministry. And um, I guess my response would be um, if you would be interested in becoming just a financial partner with what we're doing, you can give online or mail a check to this address um, and all of the money that you, that goes toward the Euro project will go toward the projects that we mentioned now, um, any medical expenses and travel expenses for people from Subirana that need to come to camo for like the neurosurgery or eye surgeries. Um, so that's the goal is to not just have a separate camo branch, we want to really start integrating the two if it wasn't for people who supported the neurosurgery program, Alexis wouldn't have gotten his surgery the next day. If it wasn't for people supporting the eye program, people with cataracts would still be walking around not being able to see. So any um, extra funding that comes into us, we're able to then um, divide it up into the other programs that have the greatest need. Um, we also are collecting medical supplies and equipment, office supplies. Um, so if you ever have gently used equipment beyond we can't take um, anything electric like electric wheelchairs or medicines but beyond that um, we take the goal this year is to do 12 containers um, which we're trying to send one out every month now and I was telling Leslie I was like I really feel like there's just such a storehouse of equipment and stuff here in the U.S. that is needing to be sent out that I truly feel at some point down the road there's going to be so much stuff that people in Honduras are like we can't use this equipment anymore. Can you please send it to Guatemala or Nicaragua? And I can see us just expanding out into the other countries, which is what it's called, Central American Medical Outreach. So I like to dream big, and I really feel like God is going to want to expand these projects and bring more life-saving um, programs to this country. So with that, I just want to thank you all for your continued prayers and support for just constantly being by my side throughout all of this because it's not, it's super fun, but it's definitely not easy. And to know that they, I have a whole church that's behind me and to support me with this, I'm very thankful. So thank you.
honor. Amen.